now we have, I hope, arguably the most influential and important thinker about the role of universities in the West, and that is Michael Ignatieff of Central European University. You all know the story about uh, uh, Viktor Orban and what's happening in Hungary and why he is moving from Hungary to Vienna. Yeah. And we are going to listen to him. As I understand it, he's going to be talking for uh, some half an hour, and then we're going to have questions. I have rarely heard somebody talk better uh, about what our job is as running universities and working and living in universities. So we're going to come through. Michael, you on air at the moment? I am. I thought you and I were doing Q&A, but I'm happy to do whatever uh, you like. Michael, hello. Um, I, we can't see you yet. Well. Uh, we're uh, going to be seeing you in just a second. So uh, do um, you're going to be coming up on this screen uh, here. So, Michael, do you want to begin by talking about uh, what is happening at the moment uh, with CEU and uh, why you are um, making the move to Vienna and what is happening to uh, university, uh, your own university and to the university sector in, in Hungary and to freedom of thought? Shall we begin there? Happy to, uh, Sir Anthony, and thank you for the invitation and um, a warm greeting to all my uh, British colleagues. I'm sorry I can't be it there in person um, because just too much is going on here in Budapest. Just so you know what Central European University is, it was founded in 1991 by George Soros um, and a group of Eastern European intellectuals because they had one instinct about the transition from communism to democracy that I think remains as relevant today as ever, which is that you can't have a free society unless you have free universities, and the universities in the communist era were um, called Karl Marx University, for example, a heavily ideological um, stamp was placed particularly on their social sciences and humanities teaching with limited freedom in the natural sciences. And the instinct of these Eastern European intellectuals was that the way to create free citizens was to create free universities. And that linkage between democracy and the university seems to me to be enduringly uh, relevant and may in fact be one of the reasons why uh, uh, CU is now in um, a controversy with the Orban government that I think is likely to lead us to have to um, establish a campus in uh, Austria. Um, essentially, we're being driven out of a European member state by government decree, and that is a development that is, in my view, a scandal absolutely unprecedented in the history of uh, European higher education and potentially a sinister portent for the future. Uh, and it needs to be seen within a wider context, which I think um, uh, British universities need to be aware of, which is a darkening climate for universities more generally in places like Turkey, where university professors and um, students face arrest, um, tight ideological controls in Russia, uh, increasingly tight ideological controls on universities in China, uh, a matter of direct concern to those British universities that have um, uh, programs in China and American universities that have programs in China, uh, and raises the question of whether free universities established in democracies can actually operate in authoritarian uh, societies in the 21st century. That's an issue that I hope you'll uh, want to think about. Just a little background word about uh, CU. We are a social science and 
Humanities Graduate School. We have about 1,400 students. They are recruited from 120 countries. We have globalized, as I'm sure you have globalized. Um, we are probably the most pluralist and diverse academic community in Europe in some ways. We're a research-intensive university, proud of our record with European Research Council grants and proud of the international rankings of our programs. So that's who you're dealing with. We happen to also be in the subjects that we teach the best university in Hungary and astoundingly the Orban government wants us to uh, wants us to leave so we will establish a campus in Vienna while maintaining a stronger presence in Budapest as we can and we've made our battle a battle essentially for academic freedom in Europe. And the final point I would make, because I don't want to go on too long, the final point I'd make about academic freedom in Europe is that the statutory language in Europe for the protection of academic freedom is, in our view, astonishingly weak. I don't know what the nature of the guarantees of academic freedom, both within the UK university and outside, that is, protect you from government pressure. I don't know what the statutory guarantee language is. All I can say is that in Europe, it's exceptionally weak, so that when the European Commission launches a, um, a legal case on our behalf before the European Court of Justice, the only language they can use is uh, <clears throat> to defend our right to uh, deliver educational services. So astoundingly, this is a small detail, but a rather important one, there is no statutory rights-based guarantee of academic freedom in the language of the treaties that hold um, uh, European higher education together. And our case is illuminated, in other words, a, um, a black hole where a strong defense of liberty should be. So that's, I hope, introduces you to the general uh, situation we face in Budapest. Very much for that. And following that, one wonders why this is happening. Are we seeing a uh, return to the 1930s? Is this altogether different? And what should we do as universities relating to fellow universities in authoritarian regimes? Should we be cutting our links or should we be doing the opposite? Should we be um, should we be reaching out to them and forming links in the hope that we can uh, fortify them and raise their morale? I think there is a general <clears throat> uh, democratic recession around the world. I don't think it's terminal. I don't think it's the 30s. But it is a darkening climate for academic freedom as a result. I've already cited Turkey, uh, Russia, China. Um, I think the Gulf states are a very ambiguous place to have a campus at the moment. Um, by ambiguous, I mean if you're running NYU Abu Dhabi, an urgent question for you is whether you're free to teach the political science of the Middle East to Middle Eastern students. Are you really? Are you free to question the character of the monarchical regimes in the Gulf states. British and U.S. higher education went into the Gulf states um, for um, altogether understandable reasons, but um, it's not clear to me that they can maintain a fully independent academic program. I don't want to pretend to be an expert in this area, and if there are people with vigorous and happy programs in the Gulf states who want to contradict me, I welcome the contradiction, but I would have questions about that. I would have similar questions about China. Uh, originally, when uh, U.S. and British institutions established themselves in China, it was in a way a different China, a China where the question of whether China would transition from authoritarian rule to democratic Pluralism was still an open question. 
that is no longer an open question, it seems to me. It has consolidated itself as a single party state with ever increasing control of the general population and of uh, academic institutions. So if you want run the Schwarzman program at Tsinghua, it is an urgent question as to whether those wonderful students who receive Schwarzman scholarships can actually study in an environment that can be truly called free. Then to the second question, Anthony, which you raised, which is, should we engage or disengage? Um, I'm all in favor of engagement. I think it's good by and large that uh, Western um, free academic institutions are in these countries, but I think they're sometimes much too quiet uh, and less than forthright uh, with their own students and faculty about the constraints that actually operate uh, as a practical matter in their instruction. Again. I'm not running those institutions, so it may be that someone in the audience has a very different view, and I welcome a debate on that. I just want to highlight that the globalization of higher education after 1989 has been one of the most important stories in higher education. Faced with this authoritarian rise of authoritarian governments from Orban's Hungary to Erdogan's Turkey, Putin's Russia, Xi Jinping's China, I think all of higher education has to ask much tougher questions of itself as to whether engagement is compatible with the basic principles of Western academic freedom. Okay, so, so let's look more at ourselves and what role should we be playing here in the West and with the prospect of uh, Britain coming out of the European Union, how should we be um, rethinking uh, our own missions to ensure that the principles of freedom of thought and research and uh, teaching continue in a world which appears to be more increasingly um, uh, unfriendly to such traditional values? Well, I think, first of all, from the CU experience, um, we were extremely surprised and very grateful for the flood tide of support that we had from individual British academics, from British universities. Um, there was a very happy week in early 2017 when this crisis broke, when the Prime Minister of Hungary's inbox was simply flooded with letters of concern from around the world, but particularly from Britain and from continental Europe. I think this did not change his mind, but I think it raised the price. And I think that any of you who are tempted to say, oh, writing another letter on behalf of some imprisoned academic or writing a letter on behalf of some university that's being thrown out is not really worth the time, do think again about that. I think the sense that the world is watching you is a constraint on some of these political actors, and therefore I would both want to express gratitude to my British colleagues for their support in times past and say that in times future, um, international academic institutions can raise the price um, by raising the visibility of repressive actions against individual academics and against um, uh, and against institutions. And I think that it's very important for uh, British academic institutions to strengthen um, their Scholars at Risks programs because there are a number of academics and we get a, one request a week from someone in Turkey saying, um, I need to get out because I'm about to stand trial for some ridiculous invented fictitious offense against the Erdogan regime. I think it's very important for um, British universities within the limits of their budgets and their capacities um, to pool in together to strengthen scholars at risk network. Um, I'm struck by the fact that these scholars at risk network where 
for example, a, an academic from Turkey gets to spend a couple of years as a senior research fellow in one of your institutions, uh, gets the security to get away from uh, tyranny and oppression. These things are elementary displays of academic solidarity that I think are important and may and may pay substantial dividends. Some of these people are wonderful scholars and would be a great addition to your um, uh, uh, faculty. Um, so those are the things that, instead of saying that um, uh, it, it, it doesn't really matter, I think it matters a great deal to show um, solidarity. On the second point that you raise, which is Brexit, um, I have a wonderful vice chancellor of a great British university on my board of trustees, and she gives me the numbers of what uh, she stands to lose in terms of European faculty who may repatriate uh, research grants she may lose. Um, whatever you think about the merits of Brexit, it's a very, very tough go for British universities. I, I, I lament it because um, one of the great achievements of British academic life in the last 40 years has been its steadily international reach, its steadily increased connection to Europe. I was at Maastricht University in February and was delighted to see that York University, the University of York, uh, had sent a very large delegation to Maastricht to see whether it was possible to forge some new bilateral connection that would enable uh, the University of York to maintain its research networks in Europe uh, and possibly through some mechanism maintain its access to European research funding. Um, and, and we are part of a uh, international or a trans-European network of social science universities led by Sciences Po. Hello. Hello, uh, Anthony. I've managed to get back on with my cell phone. I don't know whether I can be heard. Uh, well, all I can say, a round of applause there for Michael and Anthony. All I can say is the technology uh, is, is very good. Uh, and Michael, thank you. We're all very much enjoying uh, what you're saying. And the last word I heard was science po. Science Oh, Sciences Po. Sorry, yes. sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, I, look, I went to a British university. My French accent isn't very good. Just to conclude the thought, we, we are, um, uh, Central European University is part of a uh, European-wide network of social science universities that includes Hertie in Berlin, Bocconi in Milan, Sciences Po, um, uh, Lund in Sweden, uh, and us, and um, with the point I wanted to make is that LSE can't be a full member because you're no longer in Brexit, but it will be an associate member. And, and we hope that with ingenuity and clever pipe work, uh, there'll be ways in which uh, British universities can continue to um, play an active role in Europe. Because, you know, if you stand back from this, I'm a Canadian, I'm not either British or European, it is a startling fact that the best in, the best universities in Europe are in Britain. And so it would be catastrophic for Britain and for Europe if that intellectual partnership and research partnership was broken by what uh, I think Harold Macmillan used to call a little local difficulty. There you are. Round of applause there for uh, uh, that. I'm going to ask this one question and then come out uh, to the audience. And it is the um, uh, it, it's back to the question about uh, freedom of speech and our responsib responsibilities for uh, that and anything more that we can be doing, not just to reach out, but within our own countries to fight those who would try to prevent uh, freedom of thought. Well, this is a a very, very troubling area for the 21st century university. I um, 
give you an example that troubles me personally. For eight and a half years, I was a faculty member at Harvard and lived in a Harvard dorm with my wife. And the next dorm over um, was run by a uh, law school professor um, who decided um, as part of his legal practice to defend Harvey Weinstein, who, as you know, is accused of some very, very serious uh, sexual offenses. The students at uh, this undergraduate campus then proceeded to make his life impossible by claiming that they felt unsafe to have as the director of their dorm a professor who'd chosen to defend an unpopular um, individual accused of serious offenses. The university, Harvard University, the college, did not defend the professor, and he has left his post as the head of that dorm. And I think that sends a terrible signal uh, to the wider world that um, under sufficient pressure from people who have strong feelings, um, a university will bend from its commitment to defend unpopular causes or speak up for unpopular causes. I think the drama for all of us as university leaders is that the university has become one of the great public spaces of our democracy. And it's not just a public space like Trafalgar Square. The fact that a speaker comes to our university is taken by the wider public as a validation of what they're saying. That is, if we invite person X who has view Y, the, an invitation from a university body is taken to be an endorsement of opinion Y. And I, I think our dilemma is that we want to maintain our role as a great public space for vigorous public debate, pro-Brexit, anti-Brexit, pro this, anti that, uh, want to keep the widest possible frame of, of, of opinion, um, discharge our role to the wider public whom we serve by providing this public space. But we have very strong forces within the university who have decided that they feel that certain opinions are not worth hearing and not worth representing. And, and so we're up against uh, very strong forces within the university. I'm an old-fashioned 1960s free speech liberal. I, I am of the view that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words cannot hurt me. But there is a widespread view that words insult, words degrade, words um, marginalize in ways that are unacceptable and a and a liberal institution in the small l liberal sense must protect its people against hurtful and difficult speech. I think we need to be much more robust on this subject and make it clear that when people are invited to a university, it does not confer the university's imprimatur on what they say. Secondly, the university has a right to exclude from its campus people who engage in it seems to me, language and claims and arguments that simply have no validity of any kind that any academic can discern. So we have a right to affirm certain basic standards of academic debate. But we're much less pluralist than we claim, much less open than we claim. And that is opening us up to a lot of criticism across the political spectrum on the issue of political correctness. And I, in my own university, which has a very liberal reputation, I've been dismayed by some of the reactions of my own students, whom I love and treasure and their friendship I value. But their, their reaction to the invitation of a controversial speaker, particularly of a conservative disposition, has been distressing. I mean, students have walked out of, of um, perfectly respectable uh, conservative presentations that met every standard of academic respectability and civility just because they felt the mere presence of this person was an insult. Well, I just think that's very, very bad news. And universities have to get their story straight with their students, with their faculty, and with the general public and hold the ring as being a center for civil public 
debate of the widest and most pluralist possible kind. Thank you, Michael. And while the um, microphone is coming to the first question, I will have that question there. Can I just say to everybody, lest I forget, that uh, CEU and Michael are very keen to have uh, your undergraduates coming on to CEU uh, to study uh, postgrad in, is that Vienna exclusively or a bit in Hungary also? It'll be a bit in Vienna and a bit in a bit in Budapest. We are opening a new campus in Vienna, but we are a wonderful uh, graduate school. We have lots of Brits with us. We'd love to welcome your students. So thank you for for the free plug, Anthony. I'm most grateful. Um, uh, you, you, uh, already uh, a thousand or two thousand students are making their way, even as the first questioner comes in <laughs> uh, and, and now. So, and can we have the questions relatively brief? President Ignatieff, I'm not sure whether I should address you as doctor, professor, or you are indeed president of the university. Yeah. You, uh, you speak of authoritarian regimes and you link together Hungary, Turkey, Russia, and China. Uh, I have nothing to say regarding Russia and China, but Hungary and Turkey both have democratic electorates. Both governments have been voted in by majorities, quite large majority mm -hmm. in the case of Hungary. Mm -hmm. Can you make a distinction, please, between those two countries and their governments? They are properly elected, they're not regimes, and the regimes of Russia and China. That's point one. Point two, may I suggest that the principal reason why you are being asked to leave Hungary or encouraged to leave Hungary is because of your association with George Soros, who has many, many other fingers and many other pies, which are causing a great deal of concern and in some cases distress to electors in Hungary and other parts of the European Union. So, uh, <clears throat> easy question there, uh, Michael, to begin with. I, I'm, I'm delighted to make a distinction between Russia and China and, and Turkey and Hungary. I think that's, that's entirely true. But I think you can, it's also important to notice that the, um, the moves against CEU and also, I should add, against the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, a very old institution, um, forms part of a pattern that has emerged in Mr. Orban's government since 2010, the um, weakening of the constitutional court um, changes to the Constitution, changes to the electoral law, law that favor uh, the ruling party, uh, changes to the media law. That is, what seems to me important is that there is a pattern. It is not simply a case that um, Viktor Orban is going against George Soros. If that was the case, Viktor Orban would be leaving the Academy of Sciences alone, but he's essentially dismantling its academic independence. So I think there's a pattern here that your question does not fully face. And it raises another issue about what is democracy. I, I quite take your point that Mr. Orban has won elections and has an electoral mandate. But democracy is not simply majority rule. Part of the reason that universities belong in any definition of a liberal democracy is that they are, in a sense, counter-majoritarian institutions. That the role of a university is to is in the welter of Twitter and Facebook and um, newspaper articles to do what universities are fairly good at, which is to winnow the the wheat of fact from the chaff of of delusion and fiction. We're not perfectly rational. We're as subject to error as everybody else, but. The disciplines we teach and the disciplines we teach our students perform a vital function in a democratic society, which is to um, assess the truth claims that are made in politics and public life. And, and that role gives us an extremely important role and an unpopular role in democratic societies. And that is a role that Mr. Orban, it seems to me, is seeking to... Um, to reduce, if not eliminate, in, in Hungary. So I, I 
entirely take your point that you can't put all of these regimes in one sack, um, but it's important to see what Orban is doing and see that the CU story is not just targeting George Soros, it's also <clears throat> targeting the academic freedom of the most distinguished uh, academic institution in Hungary, the, the Academy of Science. And as for the implication in your question that Mr. Soros is up to a lot of very controversial things, but I am not here on earth to be Mr. Soros's defender, but I would say as mildly as I can that he's been subjected to a campaign of vilification actually without precedent in European politics. You had to be here to live through it when every single poster in the city of Budapest was plastered <clears throat> with defamatory accusations against a person who was after all born in Hungary and escaped the Holocaust in Hungary and has donated more to the benefit of Hungary than almost any living Hungarian. But that's another subject, and we can discuss it some other time. Uh, to, <clears throat> yeah. to, to, which, to which I would add, as being in Budapest three weekends ago, it was the young Hungarians who reviled at the abuse of George Soros. They were not Jewish, but they talked about the anti-Semitism of it, the state-sponsored denigration of George Soros that affects minds, that affects choosing in the ballot box, uh, is my own experience. We've now got a question, Michael, from uh, Sean Coughlin, the BBC's uh, education correspondent. Hello, Michael. Uh, you spoke about the support you received from individual universities, particularly <coughs> from the UK. Do you think you had enough support from the government in the UK and from other Western governments? <coughs> <clears throat> um, great question. I think the straight answer, because you're a reporter and you want a straight answer, is no. I think in the British case, the all-absorbing question of Brexit simply meant that Britain has been absent from any European debate about democratic freedom for since 2016. The ambassador here is a fine guy, actually a very nice guy, and very capable representative of your country, but he's had almost nothing to say about the CU matter or about academic freedom in general, I think in part because it's very important for the British government to establish post-Brexit relations bilaterally with the Hungarian government. That's a perfectly legitimate thing for him to do. <laughs> I also think the European governments have been mostly silent. I'm a, I, I'm a pretty strong European, but one thing you can't help noticing is that uh, the governments of Europe, the 27 member state governments, are usually silent about issues like this, and they leave it to the Commission, to the European institutions themselves, to raise issues about the propriety of educational legislation, and it's the Commission that has brought a case against the government of Hungary in respect of the CU matter, but basically European governments have been silent, and they've been silent because they have important bilateral relations with Hungary that they don't want to disturb. So all in all, it's not been a very good uh, story. I mean, you can summarize it this way. Europe is ferocious in the defense of its interests. Anybody who was in Greece knows how just ferociously Europe will defend the Eurozone, uh, how ferociously it will defend against most states, though not all, its uh, uh, budgetary uh, deficit limits and other matters. It's ferocious about defending its interests, and it's been ferocious, it seems to me, in its defensive interest in respect of Britain and its negotiations on Brexit. Where it, is, where it remains, it seems to me, remarkably weak is in its defense of its values. To the degree that Europe is a construction of European democratic states based on fundamental ideas of human rights, academic freedom, and democratic institutions, it's been much weaker in the defense of its values than its interests. And that 
I think should be of concern to anybody who thinks Europe is <clears throat> still um, one of the best inventions of the post-war world in the specific sense that it's avoided further conflict and war on the continent. <clears throat> and uh, there's a question, there seems to be a lot of male questioners this morning. Um, please go ahead. Yep. Um, <coughs> try to look. Uh, Michael, how much can the technology that we're using now be used to undermine the restrictions that are being placed on uh, physical institutions, you moving some to Vienna, to create uh, an online world that can go around and uh, past restrictions uh, in Europe in a way that uh, wasn't possible in the 1930s, um, and give students and academics access to the kind of dialogue that moves their thinking forward and has the chance to defeat obstacles that are put in their way. Uh, can the online world and the collaboration with places like the University of Buckingham and the ability to teach from here to you or to anywhere uh, outside the Chinese uh, Great Firewall um, enable uh, the pluralistic and tolerant uh, elements that are essential to university discussion to be maintained? I think it's a great question. I think my difficulty is someone who's been a classroom teacher and <clears throat> probably happier inside the classroom than anywhere else, certainly happier than in politics and certainly happier than the, the chair I sometimes feel here. I love being in the classroom and my problem with uh, online is simply I've, I've not yet seen a blended online model for that delivers the kind of pedagogy that is that is face to face. I mean, my sense of pedagogy always is that we're in an artisanal business that resists um, industri industrialization. I mean, I and I don't want to sound like a Luddite. I, I think you're absolutely right that new online technologies allow us to um, leap over the firewalls in some of these regimes, allow us to deliver courses around the world um, that uh, can make higher education accessible in Africa and Asia and in, um, in countries like Myanmar where they barely have had a higher education system for 60 years. There's an enormous potential for online. My question is specific, specifically, how do we deliver online that intense teacher-student interaction, that demanding person-to-person pressing and pushing and encouraging that is so crucial to great teaching. And I, I, as I say, I don't want to be a Luddite. I just haven't yet seen a blended model that I'm really excited by. And I should say, um, it's not, we are looking hard at this. And that's why it's such a good question. One of the global leaders in this field is Arizona State University in Phoenix. And we've been in very close touch with Phoenix and with their extraordinary crew, if, if those of you who don't know what they do to really go online and, and, and look at it, there may also be great models that are successful in Britain, and I'd be delighted to hear them. But my, my criteria as, 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 as rector is, can we have an online experience that is as real, as life-changing, as vivid as what happens in the best of our seminar classrooms. And that's that's the challenge. That That's the challenge. To, to be frank with you, we haven't quite met yet, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we can find a model that will work. Okay. And there are two more questions. <laughs> one over here. A very quick one. I guess universities, um, especially in the United Kingdom, are facing a fairly tough um, competitive environment. There's more focus on operating more like a commercial business. So I guess my question is, uh, is there a risk that universities will uh, focus more on, I guess, running more like a commercial organisation and, and churning out sort of degree qualifications and backing away from the difficult difficult um, conversations that need to be had? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, thank you for that. And and are we are universities more than just uh, work trainers? Uh, 
is there a serious risk that we are losing our scholarly uh, and academic hearts? These are huge issues and they're right to trouble our, our conscience. I mean, on the one hand, you know, uh, we are accountable to the public. Most, most universities, with some exceptions in Britain, uh, the University of Buckingham being one exception, we are a private university as well. <clears throat> most universities are public universities accountable for the prudent use of public money. And, and it would be, I'm happy to push back on my faculty when they resent the use of efficient business and accounting practices because this money comes from taxpayers and we need to give an honest account of it. The money that I derive from my endowment, um, it's extremely important that I manage it as efficiently as I can. Um, but there is a tremendous risk that um, we confer incrementally, we confer the governance of the pedagogy of our institutions to accountants and administrators, and that we, in the process, lose sight of what our raison d'etre is. And our raison d'etre, I think, this is going back to something I said at the beginning, is integrally connected to democracy. That is, we're not partisan political institutions, but we have an absolutely central role in training citizens from every possible background to think, T-H-I-N-K, think. And we do so on the basis of some very, very traditional methods that come to us over 2,000 years. The, the seminar dialogue, the study of texts, <clears throat> the testing of theory against experience and evidence. All this stuff is what we call a discipline. <clears throat> there are many disciplines in a university. The most prestigious of them are the disciplines of the natural sciences. But the social sciences have discipline at the heart of them. And teaching citizens the discipline of knowledge <clears throat> is the most important thing. And, relate, and, and it is an essential democratic function. And it's one of the reasons that authoritarian regimes are so hostile to universities, because they actually don't want people to think for themselves. And we need more citizens who think for themselves on the basis of fact and evidence um, <clears throat> than ever, uh, because the digital revolution has revolutionized people's access to information, but <clears throat> it makes knowledge, the, the special province of universities, you know, ever more important. And we are much too defensive um, about our defensive knowledge. Without knowledge, democracy can't make any public choice at all. Democracy can't achieve closure on any public issue unless there's a knowledge consensus about certain facts. I mean, is the climate warming, yes or no? What is the evidence? It is warming. So what do we have to do? That kind of stuff. And universities are at the center of establishing the knowledge claims upon which democratic consent and democratic closure are, are achieved. And to Anthony's point, um, one of the things that I've learned a lot from my own students is um, sometimes I talk to somebody who's got a master's in gender studies, and I ask her, you know, where are you working now? And she says she's working for, a, you know, a hedge fund in Antwerp. And you think, why does gender studies train her for a hedge fund in Antwerp, and she says, of course it trains me for a hedge fund in Antwerp, because it trains me how to understand um, human difference, human distinctions, uh, the relations between men and women, and <clears throat> this turns out to be as useful to me as the things I have to operationally master as a hedge fund. We, we need to be much more um, straightforward with our students and much more honest with them that we're here not to funnel them into vocational funnels. Most of the employers I talk to tell me, and I'm talking about big employers, I'm talking Morgan Stanley, I'm talking BlackRock, I'm talking, you know, big public institutions like the, uh, the UN. They say to me, look, 
leave the vocational training to us. Teach your people to think before they get here. Teach your people to be independent of mind, free of mind. I mean, I'm, <clears throat> I'm now an ancient gentleman in my declining years, and I can tell you, hand on heart, the toughest thing in the world is to think for yourself. And at my advanced age, I'm still struggling to learn. And that's what I want to teach my students. That, that certainly is getting a round of applause there. And, um, and the university's minister was listening to uh, what you were saying there about the defense of the independence of thought. Just sum it up, um, if you would. And, and the technology is, is amazing now. Um, and uh, just sum it up, Michael. Uh, here we are. You have... Uh, a lot of university uh, teachers and leaders and uh, students and others in this room, uh, what would you like to see us doing in the advance of civilization and the, the unique responsibility of universities? Well, Tough professionals like those in the audience don't need a pep talk from somebody sitting in Budapest. But I would say, be proud of yourself. Be proud of the vocation of universities. Focus the vocation of universities on knowledge, on teaching people to know the distinction between knowledge and rumor and innuendo and propaganda. Focus, focus on the disciplines of knowledge, the, the idea for a young 18-year-old that you're coming to university to learn a discipline of thinking, to become disciplined in your thinking, um, and for us to be intensely proud of that, not defensive about it. Yes, it is elitist, frankly, uh, but it's elitist in the service of the most democratic of all the premises, which is that democracy depends on knowledge as widely diffused and as widely shared as possible. And without knowledge, were truly lost, and the university has a vital democratic role in conserving, preserving, promoting, and creating knowledge, and that is both the driver of the modern economy and the crux of democratic freedom. So thank you all for listening. It's been wonderful to be with you. I'm sorry I couldn't be here in present, well, you, I hope in future years to be able to be sitting in the tent with you. You will be. Uh, and Michael, can I just say on behalf of everybody, thank you for uh, reminding us, which we need to be reminded about why we are here. And the sadness only is that you've had to go through such a, a difficult and brutalizing experience for you to, 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 to reconnect in a very authentic and powerful way to remind us that our values and our mission is universal uh, and it's responsible and we all need to rededicate ourselves. So thank you, Michael Ignatieff, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.